All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. I am really happy to be here with my friend Barton. And Barton is currently in Switzerland on holiday. And uh, I'm actually up in uh, uh, BC, Canada, British Columbia, Canada. So, uh, Barton, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here, Josh. Uh, Barton helped uh, to review the, the manuscript of Joy of Agility, had some incredible ideas, um, helped me improve the manuscript quite a bit. Um, but you know what? If, for those who don't know Barton, why don't you just introduce yourself real quick? Oh, sure. Um, I'm Barton Friedland. I started my career at Apple. I helped to bring the Macintosh to market. I worked at Next, Steve Jobs' computer company. Um, I met Josh in the early 2000s in San Francisco through our lovely mutual friend, Pat Reed. Where, who's the person I learned about Agile through. Um, and currently I'm at ThoughtWorks and I lead our Europe AI hub where we help people to actually get value from the AI um, ideas that they have by focusing on strategy. Fantastic, what, what a background. I mean, you know, Apple and Next and uh, just, uh, and of course our common connection to Pat Reed, may she rest in peace. Uh, Absolutely. She, she brought us together. So she was the reason we, uh, you know, started collaborating. So I, I'm very grateful to her uh, to, to know you. And uh, so we so have a lot to have... talk about. Yeah. Yeah, we do. <laughs> are you ready? One, well, one of the things that I, uh, yeah, are we, are we ready? So one of the, one of the things we were just talking about before the show began uh, was that, uh, Preparation and being ready, being being prepared, is a big part of the mantra we're going to discuss today. Absolutely. So, so the the and the mantra the mantra is uh, be readily resourceful. And um, I'm going to just read a really quick um, summary of it. And by the way, welcome, folks. Hello, Carol, Enrique. Uh, anyone else want to say hello? Please do on the chat. We love having you here. And as usual ask questions, don't be shy. So um, in, in the book, Joy of Agility, here it is. Uh, the last section, the last mantra in the book is called be readily resourceful. So the word readily means without hesitation. Agility involves being readily resourceful when facing challenges. People who are resourceful have an ability to find quick and clever ways to overcome difficulties. Being readily resourceful means not hesitating to overcome challenges, maneuver around obstacles, and quickly solve problems. This isn't always an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. Many of us are resentful of unforeseen obstacles or difficulties. Sometimes they make us feel helpless, anxious, or stuck. Those feelings are a good indicator that it's time to become readily resourceful. Doing that requires an attitude that obstacles and challenges can be overcome, that they are a means that they are meant to be overcome. Being stuck or helpless is by no means a permanent condition. You can be clever, consider new ideas, learn from others, and discover unexpected solutions. Being readily resourceful requires optimism as well. Treat obstacles and challenges like puzzles to solve. There's always a solution. Consider options, leverage diverse points of view, ask many questions, and determine whether constraints are real or imaginary. So that's just a little bit about the mantra. And uh, yeah, let's let's dive in. Um, so the, the fact is to be readily resourceful, that word readily means without hesitation, right? You're just you're just you're not sitting there waiting a month to, to be suddenly become resourceful. Your so it's a high bar. All the mantras in the book are a high bar. You know, we we seek to to get to that state, but it's very difficult to eventually reach it. Um, what does this mean to you, this mantra? Well, two two things come to mind. I think the first is kind of the idea of the jazz musician. You know, everyone thinks that like the jazz musician. You know, here we are in Switzerland, Montreux Jazz Festival, right? Right. Um, Everyone thinks that like the musician, the jazz musician is just kind of making it up. And they're not making it up. Mm -mm. What they're doing is they're improvising 
And the only reason that they know how to improvise is because they're really good players by the right. book good players they've, they've done the preparation work so that they can improvise it it isn't you just start improvising right. so i think that that's to me the the one way to really think about that that preparation aspect you can only be readily resourceful if you have the resources through the practice and the dedication and the insight that you work for and then i think the second thing is kind of the responsibility that 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 comes with being readily resourceful um, one of my colleagues, Rich Gold, um, from the Bay Area, he has a lovely book called The Plenitude, and he talks about um, he, he Rich. I don't know if you know Rich, but Rich, um, he was part of the team that built the Mattel Power Glove in the 1980s. He led that team, and it's, it was a cross-disciplinary team. And he talked about how they all kind of hated each other and threw things over the wall. And so the book is essentially about agile. Mm. But one of the things that he talks about is kind of how every solution brings new problems. And I think this is really important for this, this section because it's not that we shouldn't solve problems because we should. That's, that's what we're here. We're here to think about the constraints that we're involved with and, and innovate new ways to um, improve. But we, we need to be humble about that in that readily resourcefulness and recognize that we're not going to come up with solutions that solve everything, that they may have unforeseen consequences. And we, again, when the unforeseen consequences come, which they will, um, we can again step in and be readily resourceful. So I think it's about playing a particular role in life to take thought forward, to, to make things better, whatever better might mean in that context for people um, and, and other beings. Um, that's kind of the, the two aspects that I think it's, it's about being well-practiced and being responsible. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I guess what comes to mind as you're talking is a little bit of the connection between other mantras, because, you know, if you want to solve a, like a problem, let's say uh, you're not feeling good, you're anxious. Well, there's a donut over there. I'll feel better if I eat that donut. Uh, in a way, you could be hurrying towards a solution, right? Like, you know, you're you're actually not going slow enough to find a real solution. You know, maybe maybe for your health, it'd be better to go for a walk or, or a jog or whatever it is. Um, mm. So I, that that's what's coming to mind when you're talking, Barton, is that sometimes the solutions bring problems. That's what you think you said, right? And so yeah. what would be a thoughtful solution to a problem? Right, so without rushing or hurrying into a solution, what's a thoughtful way that could could yield something you know truly valuable? Yeah, I, I mean, but I think even if you have the most thoughtful solution, I think it's still important to recognize it still may have unforeseen consequences. R Rich's canonical example is the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, people wanted to get to the other side of the bay without having to go all the way around. Well, they built the bridge, it worked, but then people started jumping off of it. And they certainly <laughs> didn't do that, right? And then the, the problem of traffic emerged. So it's that evolutionary, you know, there's always some context in place when some solution is brought forward. That 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 solution represents the best thinking in that context. But of course, the context keeps changing. And that's what being readily uh, um, adaptable in, in the agile sense is yes. about recognizing that the context keep cha keeps changing. And you, you said something in the intro that also kind of sparked a, a thought for me, which was about that you have to believe that there's a, you can solve the problem. Yeah. And yeah. you talk about seeing it almost as a mystery. Mm -hmm. And there's a wonderful paper by a, um, a critical, um, critical business studies scholar named Mats Alveson, who talks about how important it is to approach your research as a mystery to solve. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a great framing, because if you go into a context saying, there's something here I'm not seeing, there's something here that's not visible, there's something here that's not known or understood. If you can get to that, then I think uh, when you talk about that thoughtful solution, that's where 
a, a lot of that, that power of the insight can really drive things forward um, in an exponential way. Like you talk about the bullet train um, in, in yes. the book. And it, it, they, they wanted to go at least 65 miles an hour, but they, they went to 120. So it's not, in my mind, about... 10x or double or whatever it's about really thinking what could we do here really what 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 are our levers to do things differently and that yeah. does require the thoughtfulness that you're talking about yeah yeah i i guess like um you know because there you mentioned um musicians of course uh, jazz musicians and how they improv and it's an incredible skill and it of course requires a lot of practice um, there's a story in the book about a woman who was a uh concert violist and she had uh she was playing a solo and she was supposed to play it on the i think it was on the a string of the viola and it broke and so instantly she switched to the d string and did the solo on the d string which is apparently extraordinarily hard to do and she just did it and uh that story is actually in the section on uh, adaptability so mm -hmm. poised to adapt. She was poised to adapt because that's a great word. She was so uh, ready to adapt in that moment. But the question is, okay, what's the difference between that being poised to adapt, which is one of the mantras, and being readily resourceful? Uh, I I don't have an a, an answer right off the top of my head. This is this is like this well, is the know, nuances of this. In the intro about the co concept of optimism. But I think you could, we could even press it further. You could talk about passion. Because there's a wonderful study by a woman named Bonnie Nardi. She used to be at Apple as well and, and, and was then at um, University of California in um, Irvine. And she was one of their first HCI researchers at Apple. And she did this amazing study. Um, it's called A Small Matter of Programming. Because back in the day... Um, Apple had this program, maybe you remember it, Josh, called HyperCard. Yeah. And it was it came free with the Mac, and it was supposed to enable you to do anything, but it, it was something that in the spirit of the early Macintosh, you didn't need to program to use it. You could, you could do it without a programming language. And it was a huge flop. No one used it. And so she was really interested as a researcher, like, why is it that people do these things? Why? So she studied... Um, people who knit. I don't know if you've ever seen knitting instructions, but they're really difficult to read. They're like assembly language <laughs> in programming. Um, people who do bowling, again, the scoring system for bowling, oh, um, very, very complicated. Like you'd never look at it and say like, okay, I see what's going on. You have to learn it. Mm -hmm. And so the open research question was, why do people learn these really arcane, and cumbersome, difficult things. And in every case, the data showed the answer. Because they love knitting. <laughs> because they love bowling. Mm -hmm. right? So I think that that really kind of, people are so, in our, in our era, things have become so functional. We sometimes forget that to really break the mold, we, we have to be very passionate and interested yes. in being readily resourceful it's not like i'm just going to wear my readily resource like what do you want to be readily resourceful about right so i i think you really have to be have that 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 motivation and direction to actually um mine the context because every context is mineable mm -hmm. do you want to do the work to mine it which is part of the work of being readily resourceful yeah, it's really well said. I mean, you're the love of knitting, love of bowling, of love can drive you. Like the, you want that outcome. You want that thing that you enjoy. Uh, in the case of Sir Richard Branson back in the late 1970s when he was stuck in the, so, it, you know, it's funny because Richard Branson tells this story. And one, one version of the story, he's stuck in the British Virgin Islands trying to get to Puerto Rico. Another version of the story, he's in the Puerto Rico trying to get to the Virgin Islands. The latest one I heard was he was in Puerto Rico wanting to see his girlfriend who was in the British Virgin Islands. And again, the story is, of course, he's stuck in the airport. All the passengers are told that the flight's canceled. And so he picks up the phone, calls a charter airline company, and suddenly he has a charter airplane, doesn't cost that much. He sells every seat on the plane to all the passengers who got stuck. 
So it costs him nothing, you know, one one seat, $20, $39. And he flies to, but he did that because he loved his girlfriend. And he wanted to be with her, right? That's that's the, the end of the story. He was resourceful because he wanted to be with his girlfriend. Um, you know, I'm resourceful in my own business when I would like us to have more work and, you know, have plenty of uh, clients. So we're not, you know, worried about paychecks and things like that, right? So that's, I'm focused on that outcome. And because of that outcome, I'm going to be optimistically trying stuff and, and being creative in terms of like, well, what could we do next to, you know, uh, find our next in engagements? It's, it's not feeling stuck, not being stuck and just saying, there's tons of ways to think about this, uh, to get inspired, you know, towards that goal. Um, and I, and what, what, what's the universe going to present to me? Yeah, I think John's put a great comment here. Necessity is the mother of invention. I think that's exactly the point. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you, John. I, the other story that you have in the book um, that's very similar in my mind is the story about Google in that chapter, where it was going into a period of economic downturn. They were your biggest client. Um, and you, you, you tried all these different modifications. Um, but I think what's interesting here is that kind of reading between the lines of, of this story and the Branson story, you can, I'll, I'll let you tell the story in a second, is it's not just one concern. You weren't just trying to save your business. You were also trying to do what was right for the customer. And, um, but why don't you tell the story and, and let people, Yeah, you know. sure. Uh, that was 2008. And we've been already doing a lot of work with Google, both in training and coaching for about four years. But when 2008 came, this recession was coming and Google was way ahead of the curve on that. And they er very early in 2008 said, okay, we're getting rid of all vendors, period. I don't care who you are, what you do, we're all of you gone. But, you know, they could still buy software. And by that point, we'd been spending about, that was about two, two plus years on our e-learning, which we use in our classes as well. And we basically were like looking at a loss of a big chunk of money for us. It was about $600,000 back then was really, really a, a major amount. Uh, and so we said, well, what could we do, you know, to maybe teach these classes? We had a long, there was a long list of people who wanted to take our classes. It was huge. Mm -hmm. It was one of the biggest waiting lists in the, in the company. And uh, so we said, well, what could we do? Well, we said, well, what if we just, what if they just use our e-learning, right? And, and that wasn't enough, though, because they said to us, yeah, your e-learning is very good, but what we like is when you walk around the table and you look at programmers working and you give them advice and you're looking over their shoulder. And you, mm -hmm. so, so we started to say, OK, so how could we automate that? How could we do that without being there? And that led us to a lot of breakthroughs in a short period of time. But as, as John said, mother, necessity is the mother of invention. And before you know it, we had a demo of how we could do automated looking over the shoulder and giving specific advice. And I went into Google and had a meeting with a director and she came away saying, this is a game changer, you know, and, and a few weeks later we did a huge deal for $600,000 and they said they used that e-learning all over the country, all over the, the company. Um, that was a huge breakthrough and it was just like create creative and it ended up being very useful to other customers. It was perfect for what Google needed. So, but yeah, it was just being resourceful and not being stuck or being like feeling sorry for ourselves. Oh, we just lost the client. No, we, we are finding ways to, to overcome an obstacle. What, what I really like about that story is that there's a quote that you put in it. that You said that the, the director said, is this is a game changer. And I, I, I just, I, obviously the person didn't feel like you were trying to sell them anything. Like they must have perceived it as, wow, they really cared about what we need. And that's also that the in that condo story, um, what well, no, the story about the woman who who bought the specialized jewelry at Nordstrom's. Right, Sandra, yes. <laughs> Tell that one, because that's the same theme too. Yeah, uh, this was Sandra Brown, who's our uh, COO here, our chief operating officer, and she had a, a situation where she was, she was getting married. And she had chosen a beautiful um, necklace for her wedding day. And it was custom made. And this was through Nordstrom's. Um, and 
for some crazy reason, it didn't get created on time. And um, somehow the, the sales rep discovered this and knew it was her wedding day and basically just was empowered to, to go to the jeweler, get the thing you know dealt with and made, and then brought it to Sandra's, you know, pretty much her dressing room before she got married. Um, so is that, you know, close enough to the wedding uh, minutes, uh, minutes away from the wedding <laughs> comes in with it. And she was just blown away and blown away for life is like client for life. Like that, that kind of level of service is just insane. This woman sales rep was so empowered to do this kind of thing for a customer. Yeah. And, and that just to be I mean, like, I can imagine Sandra thinking like, you did this for me, like for my, you know, and what all these three stories have in common is that in that moment, the, the, the protagonist, right, the one doing the action was acting out of their passion, completely yep. enveloped. Like there was no, like, I, I got to do this. But I don't think that, that it was just self-interest. Right. I don't think that the salesperson at Nordstrom was thinking like, I really want to get the commission on this necklace. Although right. that may have had something to do with it in the same way that Richard Branson was like, well, I can afford this, but if I can get all these other people to ride with me, it'll cost me less, but they need to get there too. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So it, it's when, it, and that's what a moment of great jazz is. It all comes together and the human mind can't actually do that. You just kind of, in a way, um, surrender to like, I'm just going to go for it. I feel like I've, I've practiced enough. It's time for me to go for this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Love that. Um, it, it, I guess, I mean, for me, I, I want to make this accessible to people. This, this concept of being readily resourceful. It, it's like, I don't want this to, what I hate is for people to think, okay, you told a story about a, a, a violist, you know, adapting on the flyer. Uh, in, a, in a in her solo in the symphony. Well, she's a sim you know a symphony soloist. She's incredible. I'm not incredible. So what does this story have to do with me? Like right. it, this is this this mantra is something I use every day, mm. where I'm like, if I'm feeling stuck, if I'm, I'm facing an obstacle, I have to step back and start to think. Well, how can I be readily resourceful? It's it's meant to be an everyday thing, and it's not for superstars. It's for all of us to not let ourselves get stuck and feel like victims if we can have this mindset of being open-minded and 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 then, then then there's the prep to being in in a preparatory state where this can happen yes uh, you know that, so, that's, I mean, it, it sounds like you know a kind of an egalitarian making this available to everybody is a very important thing to you um because it's so useful i mean it, it sucks to feel stuck it stops it, it sucks to feel like an obstacle there's the learned helplessness right where uh people just feel there's a story in the book of, of, a, of a fellow who you know this was a, a gig we did once i did where uh, we came in and the entire first floor was empty mm -hmm. um, and i wanted this group of software people to kind of collaborate in a, in a shared space and I was like, that downstairs area is perfect. We could totally use it to like create a wonderful little communal community area. So everyone came down with their desks out there with their computers and stuff. And it all got set up. This one particular guy in every single retrospective, he'd say, I don't like this open, open workspace. And I'd say, can you give us a little more feedback? And no, I just don't like it. And it was like, at the, after the third time, I said, I said, I got to talk to this guy just one-on-one. -on -one. So I went up to him like, what is it? Like, you're not saying what you don't like. You're just saying, I don't like the open works. What is it specifically? He's like, you really want to know? I said, yeah, I want to know. And he shows me, well, he's like, well, look where I'm sitting here. Because everyone had, they had assigned seats because these people were like rocket scientists. They were doing stuff where their their own computer, they couldn't just use anyone's computer. They had their own. Right. So he had a place where he sat. It's like, look, look, Josh, every time I move my like, chair in, my knee hits this post. I was like, oh, that's terrible. Well, and, and then also... It back up in my cubicle, I had pictures of my family and stuff. And like this open space, I don't have any of that. And, and also I, I had plants in, in my cubicle upstairs. Like, you know, I, it just doesn't feel good. And I was like, mm -hmm. well, I was like, well, maybe we could move you to some other spot. Well, where would you want to sit? And he's like, well, over there would be good. And he pointed to this spot by the window. And I was like, well, okay. Well, then so lunch came and then he went off to lunch. 
And I was like, I was just so tired of this problem that I was like, I'm going to fix this. So I, we wanted to move his computer, but we needed a really long Ethernet cable. So I go to this facilities guy and he's like, I said, could, could you give me like a 25 foot Ethernet cable? He's like, well, I can do a requisition. It'll take about three weeks. I was like, never mind. And I drove to a store and I bought a 25 foot Ethernet cable. And then on the way back, I see some guy selling plants on the side of the road. So I pull off. I grab some plants and I come back in and I we move this guy's desk. We move his computer, we set up the plants, get the Ethernet cord in there. And he comes back from lunch and he's just like, you know, pleased as punch. I mean, he's just so absolutely. Happy. It's kind of like the Nordstrom story you did what the salesperson did. And then the plant showed up because you were willing to take the time to go to get the Ethernet cable. And that's that, that's where the the, the momentum. Uh, that, that kind of goes beyond, you know, expertise comes in. Yes, and this guy was absolutely brilliant. So I said to myself, why didn't why didn't he feel empowered to do this? Right? He could have moved his desk. A 25 foot Ethernet cord doesn't cost much. Uh, plants cost nothing, right? It's like he even had plants and pictures of his family up in the cubicle. I mean, why why couldn't he have done it? Well, so he was stuck. Yeah, uh, yeah. About that, that was preventing him from solving the problem. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, when you were kind of revealing for all of us what his inner reasons were, like that comes back to the basic skill of to be readily resourceful. You have to be willing and, I guess, respectful of the context, right? You, you made it possible to reveal more of the context, the hidden context. Maybe other people after the retro were thinking like, gosh, you know, what is up with him? Because he's not telling, right? So we're all having our perceptions and all of that is happening. To kind of go beyond that, that that's that root cause thing. You know, in so many of the organizations that we work in, the root cause is right there, but no one really wants to look at it. Right. Yes. Yes. They prefer the superficial uh, solutions and. Uh... Absolutely. So I think I think in the story, um, what is the name of it? I can't remember. Give me one second because I wrote it down. Yeah, no worries. There's a story called Kondo. Yes. K-O-N-D-O. And I'm just going to read something that she says in it because I think it's so powerful. She says the root cause lies in the fact that they can't see the results or feel the effects. This is precisely why success depends on experiencing tangible results immediately. And I feel like she's speaking on behalf of any of us who want to enable that experience of empowerment or acceleration for the people that we work with. Hmm. And of course we can't force it on them, but we, we can offer them the conditions. We can offer our clients the conditions. We can offer our coworkers the conditions where that can happen. But it, right. we need to be mindful of the fact that we've probably been lucky enough to experience it multiple times. We know it's real. We know it's not just for um, the, the, the you know orchestral violin players, that it's for everybody. And I think that it all back to responsibility. If you want to be reliably resourceful, sometimes you have to kind of fit what it is you're offering to the people that you want to help in a way that's actually going to produce meaningful results to them, not to you. Right. Right. I, you know, when, when, when next is around, what was so exciting for me is that it had the complete works of William Shakespeare on it. <laughs> a lot of other people didn't care about that. Right. So if I had offered that to them, they wouldn't be interested in a next. Mm -hmm. I told them there's a digital signal processor. Well, that's another story, you know, so we have to be very selective about what it is we're offering people. Yes. I guess. in so in, in your life, are there, can you think of situations where you were, you know, stuck or, you know, facing an obstacle and you maybe willed yourself to be readily resourceful and, and maybe found a solution? Well, I'm, I'm going to give a kind of um, not the kind of answer that you're looking for, but it'll be a good answer anyway. Yeah. Some problems or some 
issues or blocks or constraints, whatever you want to call them, in life, they last for years. You know, whether it's the innovation of, 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 let's say, the internet, where we all knew from the beginning where it was going to go, and then the dot-com thing happened, and then the bubble burst, and it took years to get there. And now with AI, there, there's a lot of things that are possible again. A lot of people don't see. It's going to take time. I think for me, uh, what's interesting about being readily resourceful is a friend of mine talks about it like being willing to give the gift, but not expecting them to open it necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think for me, being readily resourceful means looking at whatever circumstance you find yourself with a client at the grocery store, wherever you have some interaction with someone, they ask you a question. What are you going to offer them? If you set as a condition of offering it to them that they have to do it your way, that they have to get it right now, it's not going to work. Sometimes they will, and you're really lucky, and you have a great client engagement with them because they're ready. But sometimes, whether you realize it or not, you're actually the one setting them up for the next time when they'll have the opportunity to make that choice again. So I think for me, that, that's kind of how I would answer that question, because you have to just be very clear about what your purpose is. It's back to that passion. And in a way, not accepting no for an answer doesn't mean that they have to say yes. It just means that you're aware of, of what you're giving and what impact it can have and just leaving it to the other human being to make a decision. Are they ready to be readily resourceful or not? Right. Yes. It's not like it has, it's not you're demanding it of them. You're just, you know, no. you're, you're opening up some potential ways forward. Exactly. Uh, are are exactly. they interested enough? Are they, are they curious to, to try yeah. that? Uh, I think Dylan here, hello, Dylan. He says, uh, curiosity keeps popping up in my mind as you're sharing as a muscle to exercise as a foundational capability that enables and unlocks that speaks to a personal bias of mine. I want curiosity to be my superpower. Mm. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, I think curiosity is definitely, um, you know, a, a partner with passion. Yeah. You know, you're not going to be very curious about things you don't care about. Exactly. If you're really interested in it, when someone says something, it'll catch your ear, and then you will be curious. Or, like, curious to try something. Like, let's, I'm curious, could this actually lead, bear any fruit? Could this uh, help me in my ways? I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to, to remain open minded and curious about things. Uh, there's, I, I, I sometimes, you know, LinkedIn knows that I like tennis. And so these things pop up in my feed. Um, yeah. I bring up tennis almost every time. So I have to do it. You know, it's just a tradition here. Uh, but I want to read this particular little thing that popped up yesterday. Because I think it speaks to this uh, resourcefulness. So, okay. Richard Norris Williams survived the Titanic sinking, but was advised to amputate both legs due to frostbite. Imagine that. He refused and worked to restore circulation by walking regularly. A few months later, he won his first tennis tournament. In 1920, he became the Wimbledon doubles champion. Yeah, that's a really powerful story because you were talking earlier, I can't remember quite the phrasing that you used, but you said something about people are habituated to being unempowered. How did you say it? Yeah, learned helplessness. Learned helplessness. So I think one of the things, if we're going to you know, be open and honest about the world in which we live in, is that societies sometimes teach us amazing things and sometimes teach us not such great things. It's not like everything that comes from society is helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think that's a really difficult situation when the medical institution tells you you need your legs amputated you need chemotherapy, you need this drug, right? I think it's there's always that moment where mm, maybe I don't. Yeah, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't. <laughs> and yeah. to be able to have that thought, 
it, it some ways is part of that curiosity too, because if you were to have that thought, you'd have to be curious enough, curious enough to say, is there another way? Right. Is there another pathway to right. the outcome? That's it. And and this is something that that we we learn right when yeah. we see systems. I, I, there was just a, a downpour here in Switzerland, and it rained a lot, and we were in a valley. And of course, valleys are themselves systemic formations of drainage. Right. Right. Because mountains, ridges, valleys. Yeah. All the rain comes through the valley. So I'm in this hotel. And I went down to the gym and there's like a huge flood. <laughs> in All the, the water came inside the building, the, the carpet, like halfway down this beautiful call with concrete and no one from the hotel had seen it yet. So I went upstairs. I told reception, I didn't like, I didn't panic. Though. I was like, I need to show you something. And they're like, oh my God. Then we started looking, and it turned out that a drain that had been designed into the building got stopped up, and it overflowed. And because it overflowed, it went into the building. So this is what we mean by the context changes. Yes. Right? You had to be readily resourceful. So I came up, and I worked out in the room. It wasn't as good of a thing, but mm -hmm. at least now they're going to be able to probably address the damage because if I hadn't gone down to this part of the hotel that probably not a lot of people are going to, um, it's a spot like people don't go to the gym. They go out and they go hiking. So yeah, maybe good things are happening for the hotel because they know about it now, rather than three days later when the mildew starts to set in. Yes. Yes. And, uh, that's a great story. I think it's, uh, and you, you adapted to the situation rapidly and you did your workout up in your room, which is, uh, you know, how you were agile in that moment. Um, you, you adapted quickly and, and was re probably resourceful in the, in the room to figure out what kind of workout routine can I do there? You know, but I think if, if, if I was to be really, uh, pre precise about, it, I would go back to what Dylan said. Just the idea I want to be more curious is itself the, the, the foundational step to say to, to, to set it up so that in two years, five years, ten years, you will be very agile. Right. Right. So it's about making those decisions. We're always making decisions, so many of which we're not even conscious of because I've walked up and down those stairs a million times. I know how to do it. I don't think about it. Um Everything ultimately, you, I can't remember what it is in this, this chapter, but if everyone who's listening actually reads the chapter, this will all make sense. Everything is, oh, maybe, maybe I was reading about the Swiss um, constitution yesterday. You know, in, in the Swiss constitution, the, the, they can vote to rewrite it anytime. And there's actually a stipulation, like in their Declaration of Independence, that says, one really important thing about this document is we reserve the right to completely revise it. <laughs> oh, that's great. And th that's, you know, we're, we're living in times where, where it, it, it appears that things are not working in some cases. And it's not that it's not possible for them to work. It's that we need to rewrite things. <laughs> that we need to update things for the context. Yes, um, yes. And that's the work of being readily resourceful. Do you want to be part of that work? It's very powerful work because, of course, if you're lucky enough to see it happen, you see people change. You see step changes to the practices that people have to go through to get their work done. You see a higher quality of product. You see kind of what in your mind you knew was possible all along. Come yes. to the, that's a very exciting experience. And, and related to that, there's a chapter in this section called um, "Questions Are the Answer," and mm -hmm. it's one particular story in that in that section is about um, it's a fellow that used to work with Paul O'Neill at Alcoa, and I got to know him. I interviewed him quite a bit, talked to him, and he didn't know like he didn't know anything about computers. He said he could barely like reboot. He, he knew how to do Control Alt Delete on his Windows machine, but that, like, he barely understood computers. But he right. becomes the head of IT. And you'd normally think this is a disaster, but he would just ask questions. So one of his questions was, 
he said to his staff, what would a world-class IT organization look like? And people started telling him like, and they had like 80, um, you know, server farms and they, they had an overly complicated ecosystem. And it turned out they, that they set a goal. They want to get down to like two or three of them instead mm -hmm. of 80. Um, and just, there was just, he just kept asking questions all the time and curious and, and he didn't know the answers, but the questions led to the answers. He was curious and he led with curiosity through these questions. So I, I just love that, you know, concept. there's a whole book about it. Yeah, do uh, we, does it have to be that way? Kind of opening right. up space for perceiving things differently. Yeah. What if it was different? I mean, I think all great entrepreneurs are, are always wondering about, you know, they're the, the, the Apple commercial, the famous Apple commercial about the, the people that think differently or mm -hmm. di different, right? They're, um, they're people that just don't accept the status quo. So that's, these are folks that are very readily resourceful. They're looking for. When I think about your book, I think about that it's a book written for people who would like to be people that question the status quo, but don't know how to do that right now. Yes. And that relates to the very last story in the book, which is the last story in this chapter as well and readily resourceful. And it's homage back to Linda Rising, who was on the show last week, and it's called Fearless Change. And it's about, you know, a story from that book and, and a story that Linda loves. Uh, but, you know, if you want to actually make change happen, there, you're going to encounter fear and fear of change, the status quo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to get good at finding artful, graceful ways to get past fear. And so Fearless Change and More Fearless Change, the two books that Linda is a co-author of um, with Mary Lynn Manns, uh, are great ways, great resources. But the whole book, by the way, is filled with pointers to other books and much more to study beyond my book. Uh, you know, sure. so it's if you don't want to buy books, don't don't start reading my book. It recommends all these great books to read, too. Uh, well, but, that's a nice way to get involved in the thinking. But I think w with respect to this notion of fearlessness, I think what it, it, I think you're saying this implicitly, but I want to make it explicit because the fear isn't just necessarily within me, right? The fear, I can also invoke the fear accidentally just by suggesting change to the people around me. And then yeah. I have, then I, whether I'm afraid or not, I then have to somehow graciously deal with their fear. Yes, which is not just telling them to get over it, right? But actually producing the conditions, just like you did with the guy that that didn't want to sit in the open space, right? Mm -hmm. In a way, we could say he had a fear of losing something that was important to him, and you were able to identify and address that fear in a way that made him comfortable. And yes. I think it comes back to the getting the results for people. We really have to think about each challenging person and challenging. Um, constraint as a, a puzzle, as a mystery, right? How could we make this work in, in a short time span to produce some results that people will see so that they'll want to take the next step, so that they will want to take the next step, not that I can push the next step. Yes, and there are always constraints we're dealing with. Some some coaches could read the story about me helping that 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 fellow move his desk and say, well, you were impatient. You should have you could have basically let him eventually get to it. Guess what? Constraints. I had a short window of time to work with this team. And then I was moving on to another team. Very short mm -hmm. window of time. So, and, never, and also, I didn't want to show the team that three weeks in a row or three, three iterations in a row, uh, the same problem was on the retrospective board for needs improvement. It was just stale sitting there, not moving. I, I like mm -hmm. not what we do. We don't complain about things. We fix them. So I needed to demonstrate that. And I, I was running out of time. Right. It, 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 so, yeah, you you have to have some certain goals in mind um, mm -hmm. if you're going to do this. And it's not easy. Right. It's not easy. It's it's these are these are challenging. Every mantra in the book's challenging. This is no, definitely I mean, be, being a um, improviser, jazz musician. It's not easy. But when you're in that moment, it can be really fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that gets back to the joy part, because there's a there's a wonderful joy that comes from you know, being an improvisationalist or, or dealing with so dealing with a difficulty or an obstacle and getting past it, it feels great. Maybe maybe we should close with you telling one other story because this one touches on the it's all Greek to me story. It's, and it's about you. 
where you had a breakthrough. Um, yeah, yeah. Why did one of your first agile breakthroughs? Yeah, that was where we're just about out of time here. But basically, I had to study ancient Greek in, in college and I studied French in high school, didn't wasn't a very good student. And to make a long story short, I I wasn't doing well in college ancient Greek, just like I hadn't been doing well. I didn't think I was good at memorizing anything. I thought that was a, one of my major flaws. I couldn't memorize, which was total nonsense. I ended up at a 10 week ancient Greek course in New York City that was basically six semesters of ancient Greek. Uh, compressed into 10 weeks. So it was utterly insane, one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. But it taught me a tremendous amount about, about myself. And my, my perceived limitations were nonsense. I was totally able to memorize. I just needed a way to... Tell, tell us about the part where like someone asked you, like, use the index cards. And you were like, I don't work well with index cards. I oh, use yes. Yes. index cards. That's and right. then something happened. Like... You had all the index cards, you're doing the studying on the 4th of July, and something happened. What happened? Well, I basically, you know, the fact of writing the cards, you're writing ancient Greek words on these cards and verbs, and, and I just, you know, what really happened was I had to really just study them because they quizzed you every single morning, and I just, uh, it was this immersiveness that took place that really was different in a way than normal courses, being immersed in it. For 18 hours a day, we were studying ancient Greek, and I, I'm that's about the right amount of time. 18 hours a day, um, it was just utterly insane. But so it taught me that you know these perceived limitations were nonsense, and that was a huge breakthrough for me. And what it taught me too was that even though I'd struggled in the past, um, I found a solution. So then I was like, oh, well, next time I struggle with something, I, I struggled to teach myself uh, polymorphism in the late 1980s. Mm -hmm. and the first few books I was looking at were like, this is great yeah. to me. I don't get this. So then I was like, well, yeah. I'll find another book. And I found another book and it made it clear instantly. It was like, oh, this, this, now I get this. What you said in The Joy of Agility, the one additional point that you said in the book was you, you re started to recognize a pattern that you hadn't noticed before. And maybe the interaction, you know, the physical interaction with the cards, the repetitiveness, seeing it over and over again, you started to acclimate yourself. You saw oh, yeah. something different. Yes. And I think that's kind of the magical breakthrough for everybody. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you if you submit to the process, you will be changed by it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's uh yeah, I wish we had more time to keep keep diving in into some of these wonderful thoughts. But um, hey Martin, this has been a pleasure and uh, thank you for having me. It's always nice to connect with you, Joshua. Yeah. Thank you all for coming, everyone that showed up and the questions you asked. I'm sorry we didn't get to more of them. Um, and we we this is the end of the six six sessions we've been doing on Joy of Agility. So, But it's only the beginning. Only the beginning. Yes. There's a lot more to do. So I uh, hope we'll have more sessions on this. And uh, thanks again for, for everyone to come. Bye, everyone. <laughs>